Sorry. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure today to, to introduce this sort of first, uh, I guess I could call it the first real talk uh, of the week. Um, so this is, uh, I hope I pronounced your name right, this is James McInerney uh, talking about new approaches to understanding gene content in prokaryotic pangenomes. Hi folks, um, it is one of those things that, uh, that doesn't get said in, um, in, in meetings that are you're in person is somebody in the room, you know, because I guess you can probably see them. But uh, it's, it's, I'm so pleased to be here. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. That yeah, looks good. It's not in the presenter view. We can see your... Okay, slide. I'll put it into presenter view. Um, I'm afraid I'm COVID positive right now. Um, so um, I probably wouldn't be there if we had to... Uh, I'd be a second cancellation for this meeting. But um, thank you all very much for, for inviting me here. And um, I'm very, very pleased to talk to you about this. Um, my talk isn't specifically on, on plasmids, it's on pangenomes. And it's really just sort of, I'm going to spend the next few minutes just kind of uh, talking a little bit around the subject and about a sort of perspective that we that we have on on pangenomes in my my research group and the way in which we like to think about them these days. Um, about five years ago now, uh, we published this paper. It was in Nature Micro. I think it created a small bit of um, sort of agitation afterwards um, because in the paper we sort of asked the question, what's causing pangenomes? How do they arise and how are they maintained? And it was because, we wrote this because there were many, many papers coming out demonstrating pangenomes in lots and lots of organisms. And um, they were quite descriptive. And I thought we felt that we might as well get the ball rolling in some sort of way to try to understand the mechanisms uh, by which pangenomes arise and uh, this enormous amount of gene content variation, at least in some, some species and in some groups of, of organisms. I don't think everybody agreed with what we wrote and then there were a few letters over and back since then. Uh, and it, but it's become a very, very interesting space in which to, to carry out research. And I think there's been a lot of really, really great papers uh, that, that have come along in the last few years. But we, we pushed on from this, and just maybe to, to, to summarize, if you're not familiar with the paper, to, to summarize a little bit, there was an observation that um, some organisms, say E. coli or whatever, have these enormous long-term effective population sizes. And what that should suggest to you is that there's really, really strong selection uh, in organisms with large long-term effective population sizes. And indeed, we do see this in E. coli. In at least the core genes and the highly expressed genes, you see codon usage preferences. And quite a lot of these preferences are probably very, very tiny fitness effects, but they're still sufficient in an organism with a large long-term effective population size. They're still sufficient that they, they manifest, they come through. So if selection can see such tiny differences, one codon in one protein in an organism with 5,000 proteins is producing 5,000 proteins. So it's seeing a very, very tiny part of the genome and it's, it's, it's exerting a pressure to, to, to prefer one neutral change over another, because remember, it doesn't change the encoded amino acid. These are synonymous codon usage changes. Um, if it can see that, then why do we have such a huge amount of variation? And we came to the conclusion that at least a lot of the presence absence variation in pangenomes must be selected. And the only way in which we, that could be the case is if the amount of niches are quite a lot, and uh, at least a lot of the time you have selection for new niches for, 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 for moving in from one niche to another. So we've got to try and see if the pangenomes have real signals of that. And we had some sort of anecdotal evidence, but we pushed on since then to, to, to sort of think about it in, in that sort of way. And where we've moved to is to think about pangenomes as being an ecosystem themselves. So I'm not talking about pangenomes in an ecosystem. I'm talking about pangenomes being an ecosystem. So in other words, the genetic background of any genome is playing at least as strong an effect as the fitness effect of the gene that's coming in. I mean, that'll be variable, of course. Antibiotic resistance genes are probably quite strongly selected 
in lots and lots of different genetic backgrounds uh, when antibiotics are present. Okay, so the fitness effect can overcome that. But in the long term, what decides on whether a gene has a positive fitness effect, a negative fitness effect, or, or if such a thing exists in prokaryotes, if it's neutral? And so we started thinking about the pan genome itself as a series of interactions and, a, and as an ecosystem in itself. And the variation that you see across pan genomes, of course, creates different niches for genes that might be on mobile elements and might be coming in and go, going out and, and moving around. This is, of course, you know, biology 101, really. Um, I, I don't mean to insult anybody by putting this up, but just to, 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 to maybe elaborate on what, what we're talking about. Um, if we think about uh, lots of you know, macroecology um, um, research and, 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 and understanding and have a think about what that might mean as an analogy in the gene space, uh, you can start thinking about mutualism and commensalism and competition and predation and so on, and the interactions between genes on this. And it wouldn't just be pairs of genes, but maybe lots and lots of genes in this. And mutualisms being where both genes benefit, and you probably see these kinds of things where both genes would be uh, on, in an operon, for instance, or something, something like this. Commensalism, where one gene benefits and one is unaffected. Competition, where they are in competition to each other. And we have seen a very nice example of that. Uh, Nadine Ziemer to the University of Tübingen uh, has published on some uh, halophilic bacteria. Uh, and I was part, a little part of that story as well, where we could see that these, um, these gene clusters were popping each other out. They were encoding uh, um, a, a, an iron chelator that functionally was equivalent, even though the two molecules were quite different. So the genomes could have either one or the other, but we never saw them have both. And there was lots of horizontal gene transfer happening. So it's in some kind, you know, in some way you could say that these gene, these gene clusters are in competition with each other. And then you've got predation and so on. So selfish genetic elements, we're all, we're all familiar with that. So it's just really to try to set the scene of, of, of pan genomes as a kind of ecosystem in their own right. And on, <coughs> on the left here, I've got sort of expected patterns that we might see in pan genomes. And this is just a, a, a toy diagram here, really, <coughs> that's saying sort of, if you look at the tree uh, on the left, you know, the blue branches are in, in are, all genomes that are found in environment Y, the green ones are in, found in environment Z. And then you've got the various different kinds of genes that you might see in a genome. Those gray ones, A, B, C, D, E, F, would be just clade specific. Uh, G and H are environment specific. Both of them are in, in, uh, in Y. The green ones, J, K, and L, are in environment Z. And then M, N, O, and P are a bunch of different kinds of interactions with M and P. I'll just draw your attention to it. Uh, where they're avoiding each other. So where you see M, you don't see P and vice versa. So these might be two genes that are in competition. There might be a gene dosage effect because they're producing the same thing or there might be toxicity and so on. So these are the kinds of backgrounds and there's a lot more than I've just described there, but I'm, but I'm just gonna spin along a little bit quickly to, 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 to say how we've thought about looking at these, uh, these patterns trying to find out if they actually exist or whether we've just uh, seen them in our own minds and they don't really exist. And so the, the uh, first effort was uh, from Fiona Whelan, who was, who was a Marie Curie fellow who, who came to, to work with me. And uh, so she put together, along with uh, uh, Martin Rusilovitz, a piece of software called Coin Finder, Coincidence Finder. And what it does is it just goes through a bunch of, um, of genomes using programs like Rory or Panaru or any of those for making gene families. And eventually then when you've got gene families, you represent them as a node, you connect them to another gene family if they are coincident, if, they, if they're coincident in some way. And they can either be coincident by having a more similar pattern of presence absence than you expect by chance, or they can have a more similar pattern of being the opposite, of avoiding one another than you expect by chance. So we put in some Bonferroni corrections we tried to account for tree structure in the data with this as well. And we did a little analysis of 534 streptococcus pneumonia genomes uh, when we were describing the paper. And this is the kind of output that the program uh, uh, produces. And just to maybe draw your attention to the kinds of things that we then started to see in the data. So we're asking all the time, 
about the influence of genes or genetic background uh, on the presence or absence of other genes. So, so they're modulating or they're, 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 they're varying the fitness effect of an incoming gene. Uh, and so this is just a collection of 51 gene families. Um, and the, it's just the, the, the software gives us this result. And we ask, well, you know, what does this result sort of mean? And so these are uh, VATPAs complex. You can see the ones that are on the extreme left here in uh, the two different kinds of red, I apologize for the color, but the two different kinds of red are known and hypothetical VATPAs complex genes, gene families, okay? And you can see their distribution across these uh, 500 genomes that we've, we've analyzed. And you can see that pretty much where one member of the gene family is present, you see the others there as well. There are a few exceptions, but not very many. They're really, really tightly linked, they form a clique. But as we go along, we find that for one more, and quite often for most of them, there are a total of 51 other gene families, or 51 other ones, that show a pattern of presence-absence that's more similar than you expect by chance uh, to these other VATPA. They seem to be, is that, they, they seem to be uh, co-occurring with these, uh, these others. And this is something that you might expect to see where if, uh, the genetic background mattered. If the presence of these uh, genes that we've represented in the red color was having an influence on the others or vice versa. And so that's just one sort of hint, if you like, that within pan genomes, there are lots and lots of associations uh, that we should start uh, paying attention to. We then moved on to some pseudomonas uh, uh, strains, uh, and these are from cystic fibrosis uh, lungs. And uh, Fiona Whelan did this work as well. And it's just again to show that when we looked at these, we saw a lot of relationships, um, patterns of presence and absence that you really can't explain by chance. They seem to be very, very strongly associated with each other. So I'm gonna just show you, I don't know if I can see my, my cursor, but up here in C, these, this, it's a little bit small, but you don't really have to read what's, what's on it. On the leftmost column here are all the genes, and they're classified with this red as being core, cloud genes, soft core genes, shell genes, you know, how, depending on how frequent they are in the data set. We pair this down to just look at the abundant accessory genes. So we get rid of the core, and we get rid of any singletons or very, very rare genes, because they're not going to really be interesting for us from a statistical perspective. They may be really interesting but our method would never pick that up, okay? So, they, so we just got rid of the rare ones and the core ones. And so we're looking about at genes that show a pattern of presence, absence, variability. And the third column here are, it represents a fraction that shows some kind of relationship. Either they like to co-occur with some other gene or they really avoid another gene. And you can see it's the majority, okay? So when we're looking at these patterns, most genes seem to have a pattern of co coincidence. So I, I mean, co-occurrence or avoidance with at least one other gene. And so that was quite surprising to us, but we've seen this again and again in other data sets. I'm just moving along here to, uh, 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 to, to, to look at just one other thing, part of this paper, and I'll just focus on, on this data up here. If we picked at random two genes from our pan genome, and we said, what's your Go annotation? So these are gene ontology annotations. Then about 50% of the time, they would have the same or very similar Go annotation, okay? About half the time. If we look at the data that comes through from the CoinFinder pipeline, we see that it's much higher, around 70%. They have the same Go annotation. And so we, we think this means to a certain extent that genes that are functionally doing the same kind of thing are either very strongly they like one another or very strongly they don't like one another. And that this kind of structure is coming through in the data set as well. And that they're a little bit more agnostic about genes that don't have the same Go annotation as themselves. Um, so moving along then, we with uh, Rebecca Hall, who was in my lab for a while, who looked at E. coli. And she looked at E. coli accessory uh, 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 genes. Uh, this is a data set, a relatively small data set, about 200 E. coli genes. Genomes, uh, we, uh, we, we reduced it down a little bit because of runtime and uh, the difficulty of, of wrangling such a big data set and, and making it sort of um, work. But this is just one sort of analysis uh, from 
from this data set. And so these are a, a bunch of um, <coughs> a bunch of <coughs> sorry <coughs> a bunch of membrane proteins. And you know we have this sort of feeling that when things form complexes of two or three or four or five uh, uh, proteins, that they should really always uh, be found together. And that's actually not really the case. Uh, uh, for these, you can see um, that, for instance, these four up here, these four complexes up here, they seem to, to uh, uh, co-occur quite a lot, but it's not always that every gene in the complex co-occurs with every other gene in all, all of the others. So there seems to be much more of a mixing and matching uh, of genes in complexes like this, uh, to a certain extent, in this particular uh, uh, group of E. coli. You can see Avoidance here, this SOAR ABFM complex here, completely avoids this, this, and this uh, gene. They don't, they, if one is present, the others are not present. And this is the whole complex in this particular case. So it really is a case of mix, mix and match on that. Um, this analysis is based uh, entirely on pairwise comparison of the presence and absence pattern of individual genes with other individual genes. And so when, when we make a network, uh, I'll just go back to, to one of these sorts of networks. It's a gene family is a node, another gene family is another node, and they're joined by an edge. And so it's a pairwise comparison, but quite often that builds up to being a much more complex network than this. Um, it's a little bit slow, and we were also interested in the question whether we could get um, more complex patterns. So it's not just a pair of genes, but maybe two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight genes forming perhaps a genotype. And if we could, if we could iterate across uh, lots of, uh, um, of genomes, we could begin to understand a more complex pattern. So for instance here, this is an example of the random forest approach. I'm gonna show you some pre preliminary data um, where we we're looking at genes A, B, C, and D. And we're trying to say, is there something about the presence or absence of A, B, C, and D that uh, implies to us whether gene X is present or absent? So this is the output we're trying to explain, the presence of gene X. And uh, this would mean that it's absent, gene A, and this means that it's present. So you're dividing the data set. You're using pretty standard uh, decision tree approaches in order to try to understand what's, what's happening. And, down we get to the bottom here, we have gene X is an outcome, its presence is, is an outcome in three cases here, its absence in three others. And by using a random forest approach, we're trying to, to, to understand the influence of genes on one another. We again come out with a, a graph that's very much like this. At this time, it's a directed graph where we can talk about the influence of one gene on another and how likely a gene is to be present if the if gene, sorry, how likely gene B might be to be present if gene A is present, or how likely it's to be present if, if A is absent. That, that sort of thing. <clears throat> this is the first analysis we have. It's on 500 E. coli genomes. This isn't published. Uh, this is work was done by Alan Bevan in my lab. And what you've got here is the result of the uh, random forest approach. Uh, we've got a graph, it's got lots and lots of connected components, and it's got some rather big connected components in the middle, which we can break up using a community uh, discovery algorithm like the Louvain algorithm or something like this. What is very nice about this is, of course, because we can ask about uh, um, collections of genes that explain the presence of another gene, but also we can ask whether there are genes that explain the, the, the absence. And of course, some genes are completely agnostic. Their presence or absence doesn't explain the presence or absence of any other gene in the data set, but some strongly do explain uh, presence or absence. Now, uh, this is fairly new data, so, so it's not what it's going to look like in, in final publication form, but I'll just take you through the two sort of clusters that I'm highlighting here. So the top one here are negatively interacting clusters. And so you can see this sort of bar here. So just to say the group 36017, which is a gene family, uh, its presence um, strongly seems to suggest the absence of group 36270, but not the other way around. And that can quite often happen when there's a gene frequency difference. But we can put directionality onto it because of, because of the way in which we, we, we look at the data here. <coughs> These two gene families collectively 
imply the absence of the other one. The presence of, of 36017 implies the absence of 43090. But down here, we've got another collection. It's this sort of lilac group here, where lots and lots of genes are implying that the presence of lots and lots of other genes, their presence strongly implicate, implies that another gene will be present as well. So we're going through the data right now. I've put this up because it's pretty much uh, the newest thing that we've done. But it's just to say that um, in this kind of approach, we're really just using fairly standard Python libraries, fairly standard approaches to it. But it is really beginning to tell us something about this eco ecological sort of situation. Um, you can sort of view this if you were in a sort of macroecology way to say, you know, next time you go to your local park, you see lots of grass on the ground, you see a big tree in the middle of the park, there's no grass growing under the tree. The tree doesn't care about the grass, but the grass is highly sensitive to, to a tree being present or absent. And so we're seeing these kinds of patterns begin to come through in the data set as well. Um, the, the, whole, the whole ambition is to try to uh, uh, tease apart in pangenomes the forces that influence the presence or absence of another gene in the genome. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't really talked about sort of specific genes here, I've, I, just in passing, uh, because there are just so many stories to tell that, that it becomes a situation where this data set or this approach gives you lots of stories, uh, which then can be taken into the lab, if you like, or it can imply by sort of smoke and gun analysis that some genes are implicated or involved in particular pathways and so on. Uh, conclusions are there, networks in illuminate pangenome evolution. Pangenomes themselves do seem to be an ecosystem with you know, antipathy, uh, with you know, a positivity, negativity, pathogenicity within the pangenome itself. And we can see again and again that genes can predict the presence of other genes and they can also predict their absence. Uh, the work was all done by the four postdocs on top here, Maria Rosa, Fiona Whelan, Rebecca Hall, and, uh, and Alan, uh, who wrote pretty much all the code and, and, uh, and uh, did all the data analysis. Thank you very much. I've come to the end. I hope I didn't go too fast or too slow. Thank you very much. That was fantastic and that was perfectly on time. Um, uh, Alice, do we have time for brief questions now? If we want. Um, well, if anyone does have questions that um, that are reasonably brief, then uh, type them in the chat and we can kick them off. Otherwise, there's a discussion session later. Although I think they did, it's possible that they would have already put them in. Um, I have things, but I think I'm not going to, I think I might save them for later. Okay, that's it. Um, thanks very much. That was super interesting. Uh, I hope you have a full recovery, by the way. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so time to move on one more time. Um, and uh, Fernando's not gonna be happy with this. I, I, I'm using the I'm using the web page to to get the titles of the talks, and the web page doesn't currently have Fernando's title. Fernando, I'm so sorry. It's your turn to talk, but I don't know what your title is. Okay. No, but, but the secretary uploaded it. Yeah, but maybe he has to refresh the. Maybe I can't. Anyway, my, the title of my talk is Plasmid Taxonomy. Okay, so can I start? Absolutely, please do. Okay. If you go ahead and share, I'll tell you if we can see it. 